So I'm just so happy uh, today to be introducing uh, Daniel Fernandez Pasquale and Alan Schwabe, uh, otherwise known as Cooking Sections. Um, as I think many of you know, uh, Daniel and Alan are a pair of uh, spatial practitioners, um, to borrow their term. We move freely between design, writing, research, um, and yes, cooking. Uh, their methods are curatorial, uh, historical, ecological, culinary, um, but also, I think, fundamental to the work of architecture um, itself, so we're super happy to have them here. Uh, they're based in London, um, and they've been teaching at the RCA, uh, where they've been leading a studio recently on the question of natural capital. And they've been exhibited and published incredibly widely, including in our own paper review. And I'm especially excited to say in public um, that they'll be publishing their next book with us, uh, Columbia Books on the in the City, on the Empire Remain Shop uh, project, which they'll be sharing with you uh, today. And they will also be sharing uh, some of their uh, cooking talents with you later, uh, so you have that to look forward to. So I've had the privilege um, of attending one of their Concord dinners, uh, which do I think an incredible job of bringing together um, environmental and political uh, thought into what feels like a dinner party with uh, a few of your new best friends. And I, I hope we can sort of cultivate uh, a bit of that vibe today. And to me, the brilliance of the Common Core project um, is that uh, it seems to me that Daniel and Juan really recognize the way that food uh, both sort of you know, brings people together in a cliche sense of a sort of provisional social encounter, uh, but also that it links us into these sort of globalized networks of food production that remain based in colonial history, as well as linking us to sort of ongoing ecological crises um, like desertification, desalination, rising sea levels, and so on. Climate, of course, has cultural effects, um, and indeed climate is culturally produced. And so with that, I mean, so the format for today, we're going to have a short lecture uh, from Daniel Long, um, maybe 30, 40 minutes, I think. Uh, my colleague Jesse Connick and I will join them for a bit of conversation, and then uh, we hope there will be time for an especially sort of robust uh, exchange with the audience. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Kirkman Section. Timber from Bermuda. Lamb from New Zealand. Fruits from Cyprus. Fish from Nigeria. Sugar from Mauritius. Cotton from Uganda. Jungles today are the gold mines of tomorrow. This series of images of global capital and food trade were produced by the Empire Marketing Board in the 1920s to encourage British citizens to consume foodstuffs from the colonies and overseas territories. The Empire Marketing Board constructed a highly sophisticated imaginary using landscapes and architectures to promote um, protectionist forms of shopping. For today's lecture, we will um, be discussing one of our latest projects, the Empire Remain Shop, through a different um, series of images. Under intensive visual propaganda, reminding us how empire buyers are empire builders, the British government tried to boost trade through marketing foodstuffs that were cultivated all across the empire. The colonial planet became the supermarket for consumers all across the, the planet and the world, making availability of products of produce as a given. At the same time, the circulation of exotic tropical items also introduced a new series of stimulating substances for the bourgeoisie and industrial workers alike, whereby vitamins, caffeine, nicotine, chocolate, and sugar not only enhanced pleasure, but boosted productivity in factories by making the human body dependent on energetic, energetic and relax, relaxing substances. The fact that citizens would, could not experience in the flesh um, the production sites of those foodstuffs made them believe in the construction of a new world imaginary. Propaganda in the forms of posters, films, recipes, um, all to uh, try to, to depict the geographical gap um, that was constructed between two realities a relative proximity to a site of tropical foodstuffs and a relative distance to the abusive and violent labor conditions to produce those same products. 
So the planet, to a certain extent, was transformed into a highway connecting and disjointing sites of production from sites of consumption. At the same time, colonies were depicted also as sites where inhabitants and wilderness had to be tamed, while the more civilized dominions were organized by strict geometric order. And here, this is just one example where on the right, you see a uh, sugarcane grown in Barbados, and how both kind of the, line, the landscape and the subject have to be put under order where in South Africa and the orange groves are all fashionably ordered, um, very technological, where the human body doesn't exist and kind of everything happens uh, on its own. So, buy empire every day reminds the empire marketing board posters to pedestrians in London in the 1920s. The responsibility of the economy of the nation was no longer a matter of um, the government, but it was transferred onto people's consumption habits. So if you don't buy and the national project collapses, uh, it will be your responsibility. Empire shops were planned to be opened in London in the 1930s. They intended to make sultanas from Australia, oranges from Palestine, cloves from Zanzibar, and rum from Jamaica available and familiar in the British Isles. Through a series of empire recipes and empire products, the shop aimed to push people to buy cinnamon or nutmeg, but at the same time being indoctrinated on how to use them. None of the shops events ever managed to open, as the economic system of tariffs was introduced and the idea of an empire shop became redundant. So after a series of research trips <coughs> to uh, the Caribbean and the Antipodes and many other places, tried to track the contemporary legacy of the food infrastructures that were put in place by the British Empire, we decided to open um, the first empire shop last year. Yet, instead of selling products from the empire, the empire main shop was launched as a platform to speculate on the possibility and implication of sending back the remains of the British Empire in London today. Over three months of duration between the Brexit vote and the Trump election, it employed food as a tool to question current forms of power while aiming to dismantle geographies, origins and exchanges across the present and future of our post-colonial planet. This is one of our um, shop makers. For the Empire Remains shop, the original vision of the never opened Empire shops and their five part poster displays was reinterpreted into this digital um, platform. So we invited over 40 contributors to respond to the still present remains of the Empire power structures by drawing together performers. Uh, yeah, performances, academic papers, dinners, trips, sonic nights, or culinary provocations. Each contribution responding to the implications of selling the remains of empire today. To overcome limitations of duration and disciplines, contributions and contributors operated through a different set of agendas. After centuries of violent colonization, land dispossession, and appropriation of natural and cultural resources, the world still favors uh, political structures that promote ne neoliberal nationalism. The Empire Remains shop traced the construction of landscapes, imaginaries, economies, and aesthetics that derived from trading imperial foodstuffs in order to critically think of political country structures for more or a more evenly distributed hyper-globalized world. So in that regard, the Empire Main Shop was used as a method to understand the space in which power structures operate and explore how to use that as a field of opportunity to simultaneously challenge them. This is a recipe um, of the Empire Christmas Pudding from 1928. It links a series of 17 ingredients with 17 different geographic locations all across the globe. Currants from Australia, cinnamon from India, cloves from Zanzibar, and apples from Canada. But more than recipe, um, this list of ingredients operates as a map. The Empire Remains Christmas Pudding tracked the changes that have occurred in a post-colonial food market 
by exploring the economic strategies and forces that are at play. In a process that lasted a few weeks, the same list of ingredients from supermarkets all across London were sourced. The Empire Remains Christmas Pudding made evident that once foodstuff promoted a specific origin. Today, majority of food products are either packed in the UK, milled in the UK, produced in the EU, or using sugar from a range of countries, or even being the Marara inspired, rather produced in the Marara. The new economies of origin are not about promotion of place, but the erasure of it. It is more economically viable to change the origin of the product every month according to, pri to prices predicted by national conflicts or weather disasters without having the obligation to tell the customer about the changes that are made to the products he purchases and consumes. In that regard, the certain dissolution of origin has shifted the logic from made in to made nowhere. A series of spaces in former colonies have emerged of the financial extraction of value, no longer agricultural, but economies based on a place that does not need soil fertility to cultivate that produce. Instead, they are places whose value depends on a disconnected economy. These offshore economies are epitomized by buildings like the Ugland House here in the Cayman Islands, where almost 20,000 global firms are registered in the same address, all housed in this four-story building. Following these new spatial and economic structures that emerged from this imperial legacy, this presentation is structured around five notions to explore possible future scenarios that could disrupt that violent logic of perpetual circulation and accumulation of capital and others' ways of thinking about the built environment. In July 2013, lab technician Kenneth McRae murdered his wife Jane before killing himself in the West Midlands. He went mad after finding out that Japanese not <coughs> was growing under his house spreading from the nearby golf course into his property. But no nutweed was found in the property after the fatal murder. Last year, William Jones hanged himself after being notified by the local council that the land he owned had Japanese nutweed growing on sites. Japanese nutweed and other non-native invasive species have been put at the forefront of a war against non-humans in Northern Europe but especially against invaders in the UK. They have been accused of taking over lands, private property and public grounds, gardens and forests, houses and old factories, highways and waterways, any ways in which a plant appears everywhere. Much before people started to panic about the presence of Japanese knotweed and take their life in their hands, the government allocated enormous funds to try and deal with the problem. The problem? Plants from elsewhere invade us here. The total cost of handling Japanese knotweed and other invaders for the taxpayer in the United Kingdom is about £200 million annually. It is estimated that the global expenditure on mitigation and eradication programs actually exceeds £1.8 trillion. In the 2000s, Japanese knotweed turned from a horticultural problem into a mediatic event. Journals, newspapers, tabloids, all reported the great invasion. The garden invader that could sink your mortgage. <laughs> the plant that ate Britain. <laughs> Not in my backyard. <laughs> At war with aliens. Panic was not caused by the presence of Japanese nutweed. It was banks and credit institutions who made people panic. Any trace of Japanese nutweed in one <coughs> private property would likely result in the refusal to grant a mortgage. Real estate market and property value were victimized through the threat of the plant. And then a new industry of fear was born. For the construction of the subjective taxonomies of native and non-native, pseudo-objective thresholds are to be demarcated. So science and politicians need to determine the precise time an alien plant arrived, or also when it became naturalized. The amount of years that a species has inhabited a certain place should be theory enough to determine its degree of belonging. 
Yet, what is the threshold? Is it three years? Thirty years? Or hundred years? Three thousand years? Thirty thousand years? Over the, the past two centuries, the plant has experienced the planet has experienced incomparable movement of species across the globe. If we were to, to, to consider a longer time perspective, most native flora could be actually referred as to an alien invader. Not only the definition of native or non-native is challenging, but the association of the alien as a negative agent plays a crucial role in this distinction. Japanese knotweed Fallopia japonica has been stigmatized as a non-native invasive or the plant that can sink your mortgage. There are two main reasons why it has created such an uproar in British media. First, being declared a non-native invasive plant, but also the fact that it can allegedly penetrate through the foundations of any house. However, both statements can be contested. Far from scientifically objective classifications, determining when a subject becomes invasive or naturalized depends on the artificial definition um, of spatial and time boundaries that confine her. On the other hand, there is no rigorous evidence of Japanese knotweed being more damaging than other plants when it comes to growing through a crack on a concrete surface. Scaremongering, deflation of property value, and the refusal to grant mortgages <coughs> Sorry, to homeowners that have found Japanese knotweed on their premises are processes that have created a market of expensive eradication programs. And here we can see one of these forms um, where um, banks deny a mortgage based on uh, the presence of the plant. So the next invasive is native, rethinks the alien as an entity that actually constructs a new reality and brings a valuable hybridization. As part of it, we started an archive of properties in the UK that have been devaluated by the Japanese Nautilus yeah. and houses that have witnessed a homicide or suicide because of the panic and the presence of the plant and the loss of the value. As the Empire remained shop, we decided to open the Devaluing Property Real Estate Agency to think what is the agency of a plant in challenging the real estate market lobby in a city like London. It was installed in our shop window, and the devaluing property real estate agency replicated the all too familiar aesthetics of real estate um, window displays in central London. Hundreds of people stopped by the window to look at our assets on Baker Street. Some engaged with the topic, others ridiculed it, and others became infuriated for, for playing with such a serious business and a stable pillar of society. After a half hour of consultation, on how to devalue your own or someone else's property through the presence of the Japanese knotweed, customers were served the plant that can sink your mortgage ice cream. A recipe that incorporates and embraces Japanese knotweed as part of a post-industrial city ecosystem, showing one of the many ways the prolific growth of the plant can be put into use, rather than fighting it through million dollar pesticide programs. Different from plantation houses being surrounded by the fields where value used to be harvested, the bungalow emerged as a building typology for capital flows not from the immediate vicinity but from afar. The garden surrounding the bungalow had in time a hedge to demarcate the property of the landlord and remind local inhabitants that the space of the bungalow was also the site to manage exploitation. <coughs> One of the plants that the British first introduced in India for the ornamental hedges around bungalow properties and displayed the power relations that separated the garden from the outside was Lantana Camera. In less than a century, Lantana Camera has become one of the great threats to wildlife and farming all across India. Brought from America to Europe by the Dutch and then transferred to India by the East India Company, the plant serves as an ornamental hedge and a butterfly in a tractor. However, Lantana has taken over 30 million hectares across India and the rest of the planet and has prevented thousands of people from foraging other materials from the forest. On top of that, abusive envir environmental laws that aim to protect the forest from this invasion have not but displaced them even further out for the sake of keeping forests pristine. 
In collaboration with Bangalore-based Forager Collective, we met with some members of the Soliga people, a group of indigenous uh, tribes living in the MM Hills, Karnataka, to learn about the ways they have started using Nantana to produce furniture as one possibility of economic resistance. The Solinga had lost access to bamboo, their traditional building material, due to a series of laws that did not allow the use of it as a free resource. Lantana became the only raw material available they can legally have access to. So contrary to the sturdiness of bamboo as a material, Lantana is much more pliable and allows for a flexible use. Although the craftsmen were producing furniture with lantana, they were actually copying the shapes of bamboo items that were used to. So as part of the project, we developed together a new prototype of furniture made out of lantana that explored a new geometry and aesthetics derived from the plant. The forest does not employ me anymore looked at another form of economic success. Against the conventional logic of growth, the ultimate aim of the business was to round out of raw material and go bust. How would the business sell enough stools to get rid of 13 million hectares of Lantana Camera, enforcing bank bankruptcy upon our own business? Brown shrimps used to be one of the most important sources of protein in the inhabitants along the riverbanks of the Thames in London, all the way to its estuary. In order to keep up with the tremendous demand of for shrimp sandwiches, the very laborious peeling of the shrimp and not its abundance is what has been dictating its prices. The cheapest way to have affordable shrimp sandwiches in London was to send the shrimps to be hand peeled in designated special economic zones in Tangier and Tantouan in Morocco, only to be sent back to Europe afterwards for consumption. As peeling workers are paid by the amount of the shrimps they manage to peel in an hour, and they are very tiny, we could say that shrimp peeling factories are effectively ruled by the freedom of the seas. Freedom from labor regulation, freedom from environmental regulations, freedom from duty impositions, and freedom from international property rights. Shrimping after working conditions was a new project for the Empire Main Shop by the London-based duo frauds Audrey Samson and Frank Gallardo. Their practice investigates <coughs> forms of death making in the way space is managed. In the case of the brown shrimps, the fact that it is peeling, its peeling has become more and more expensive with the years has ended the fishing of the shrimps. Rather than being extinct, brown shrimps have gone commercially extinct. And paradoxically, that commercial extinction is what enabled their survival as species. As part of Fraud's investigation on how to die in a neoliberal age, the project consisted of a series of shrimping acts on the estuary and a performative peeling dinner. The tiny brown shrimp was tracked from its water to its peeling facilities, while guests were kindly invited to participate in the laborious and tedious act of peeling and weighing the dinner. At the Empire Main Shop, a rum and bioethanol fountain <coughs> alternately gives away one or the other according to the daily price of oil on NASDAQ. The macro scale logic of cycles of offer and demand is what eventually constructs and destructs spaces of production of sugar derivatives. From what once used to be the jewel of the British Crown, an island with 97% of its land used for sugarcane plantations, Barbados has almost entirely lost its major economy today. The complex technological invention that allowed to extract brown crystals of, of, out of sucrose from the, juice of, from the juicy sugarcane grass not only established one of the most violent forms of torture and enslavement in the history of humanity, but also was perpetuated as a way to supply sugar to the ferocious European and North American markets. So the sugar mill um, ran on free labor first, and later on almost free labor. It made the world dependent on sweets, as it made the working classes in industrial European cities be able to work to exhaustion under the effects of the calories supplied by Peruvian sugar. An industrial factory in London and a sugar mill in Barbados became tightly connected. Both oppressed 
oppress their workers and both were part of a capital flow that delayed processes of urban transformation. Indeed, as it has been suggested, it was the Barbadian sugarcane fields that eventually modernized European cities. In sugar traders, many of which are still in elite power positions in main cities in the world, owe their fortunes to those landscapes, ranging from world-renowned art museums to libraries, monuments and universities. Furthermore, the sugar conflict between the UK and the EU around the privileges of the two Commonwealth sugar-producing countries have pushed most of these post-imperial spaces to stop harvesting sugar. The EU prioritizes internally produced beet sugar from France or Poland to cane sugar coming from overseas tropical sites. Hence, Barbados is arriving soon to its last harvest. Sugar refineries on the island are at the verge of an economic collapse. Trying to think how to adapt to a global market that defends that they are an independent nation. And yet, does not buy their bulk sugar as it used to do. The future of sugar cane is uncertain, especially as Caribbean rum cannot be, by law, um, cannot be produced by law with uh, sugar molasses from outside Caribbean islands. One of the possible alternatives has proposed to redirect sugar molasses uh, onto the production of bioethanol to keep the sugar landscapes existing, but the demand for it relies on the prices of oil. Whenever oil prices are low, international demand for bioethanol drops, and sugar molasses is used for rum production. But whenever oil prices go up, the world suddenly needs sustainable alternatives to fossil fuels, and accordingly, Today, we are green is a fountain that does not let you choose. It either serves rum or bioethanol according to the price of oil that day. In 1916, the Middle East was divided in two between the British and French counterparts. The sykes picot Agreement drew a line that led to decades of international conflicts and wars amongst main military powers of the world for appropriation of other national resources. Since the opening of the Palestinian potash mine in British Mandate Palestine, the extraction of fertilizers in the Dead Sea has made that landscape one of the top seven potash extraction sites in the world. Aiming to solve a global shortage of food, the hyperfertilization of soil worldwide has created spaces where utter destruction is legitimized in order to solve world's famine, but also to allow us to consume strawberries any time of year. The mineral factory in the Dead Sea constitutes one of the global sites that has created the need for hyperfertility, while it also materializes the way it is contributing to a certain end of seasons. The entanglement between alterations in the climate and the constant supply of fertilizers, rich in potash and nitrates, can help us think about other practices beyond the abusing of the soil. Since the early 2000s, the Dead Sea level has been dropping a meter a year. With it, the surface of the Earth has not only entered a state of permanent risk of subsidence, but it has also literally created over 5,000 sinkholes along its depleting shores. These um, sinkholes have taken over the unique desert landscape, some as large as 2 km long and 25 meters deep. Um, water runoff from the desertified mountains seeps into the ground where the sea once lay, dissolving underground deposits of rock salt and creating huge cavities that eventually surrender to the weight of the earth on top. Driving along the banks of the Dead Sea, the site of abandoned beach resorts, empty buildings and diverted roads amidst the arid landscape feels like an apocalypse in the lowest place on Earth. Three main forces are accountable for this radical transformation. A series of dams built along the Jordan River Basin in Israel, Jordan, Syria and Lebanon. The exhaustion of underground water resources for Israeli day palm plantations in Palestine and above all, the extraction of fertilizers, fertilizers from the evaporation ponds run by the Dead Sea Works in Israel and the Arab Potash Company in Jordan. 
that have been operating since the time of the British Mandate. Under the sea there is a hole, is an installation that explores other ways to reduce the need for adding nutrients to the soil while still feeding a growing population. As a setting, a series of 25 suspended dining surfaces map out the 5,000 sinkholes of the Dead Sea. On top of them, a climb of our performative dinner takes place. Climb of War aims to consider a new climatic season, different from the now obsolete cycles of spring, summer, autumn and winter, climatic events may span over days, months, years or centuries. And here we really try to think of how uh, a process that is well evident today, when you walk into a supermarket basically you get all foods year round and this idea of uh, Seasonal um, agriculture, seasonal food has become a very niche uh, practice. So, Climavore sets out to frame the new season of food production and consumption that are appearing due to those human induced climatic events. It reacts to current drought, desertification, water pollution, flash floods, or invasive species. So, the idea behind Climavore in a way is to adapt our diet to a globally financialized landscape what to eat during periods of severe scarcity of water, or what to eat uh, when there is an increased salinity of the soil. Uh, so to a certain extent, Climavor aims to develop a changing form of eating that, function, that functions as uh, infrastructure. Uh, it questions also the geopolitical implications behind the making of climatic alterations and the pressures they enforce on local inhabitants. Different regions are struck transnationally by heat waves and cycles of droughts that can last for several years. More recently, the fertile straight state of California has suffered the consequences of excessive irrigation, which in many cases has led to the unexpected appearance of dangerous sinkholes around overlay irrigated areas. In times, the water scarcity, rather than local or organic, can promote, um, rather than local or organic vegetables, crop crops requiring less water, like millet, barley, lentils, and pomegranates. All these could slow down the exhaustion of aquifers much more effectively. However, under the imminent threat of uh, buildings collapsing over cavities underground, dry farming could provide a form of reshaping landscapes during periods when water is scarce. But is there real, a real scarcity, or is it a matter of an ethical distribution of available resources? Since the popularization of the term after World War II, desertification has become a powerful political tool to mobilize action against, um, uh, well, or based on the propagation of fear. Especially as administrators of development in the African continent, needed a problem dramatic enough to legitimize mitigation and control of both space and people. Inhabitants from arid regions did not suffer from aridity. They knew how to flexibly adapt and freely move by making their foraging, agricultural and hunting practices migrate with the seasons. But once that mobility stopped, the desert started becoming a problem. Residents of the Sahel have been blamed for decades for land misuse, while main corporations have been offsetting their environmental damage uh, through greenwashing restoration programs. The desert has become a new frontier for climate-related investments, controversially linked to IMF loans and pollution offsetting trade-offs coming from the upper north, as well as new power structures that collide with pastoralist and uh, nomadic constructions of space. So despite having been described as an ungovernable landscape, the edge of the Sahara is a region spanning over 7,000 kilometers from east to west coast of the African continent that can shed a bit of light on how to deal with nature and urbanity in the post-colonial context. In 2010, a Pan-African alliance of the countries along the Sahel committed to planting a great green wall to slow down desertification at the transnational level. This 10 mile wide deforestation project consisted of, or consists of drought resistant species requiring little irrigation, ranging from gum trees to cashew trees or moringa trees. Climate for them thinks 
how these foodstuffs can serve as a form of infrastructure in face of a, a world shifting through an ongoing series of climate alterations. Um, this is what we're going to taste in a moment. Uh, our climate board is a soccer made with uh, moringa for the tree. Um, so some of the Empire Remain shop uh, explorations revolved around these five ideas uh, speculating on the selling of the remains of the British Empire in London today. Devaluing and degrowth, bankruptcy as success, commercial extinction, lack of choice, and the appearance of new climatic seasons. As the Empire Mint shop closed its doors in November 2016, the afterlife of the project continues in the creation of a franchise agreement, or a counter-franchise agreement. In that way, the Empire Mint shop can open in other parts of the world as a platform to respond to post-colonial context elsewhere. Using the research, work, and knowledge developed so far in the Empire Main Shop, the franchise is ready for institutions, collectives, or individuals to set up a counterpart and investigate the power structures still in place. The upcoming book that we'll discuss uh, a bit later today about the project um, <coughs> will work both as a documentation of the project so far, but at the same time as a manual on how this platform will respond and disseminate the colonial infrastructures is still permeating in society. So if some of y'all want to filter up here as you grab your paper. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting and relevant support research as well um, into the project. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how it operated as both a research and curatorial project and yeah. how those supported each mm -hmm. other. So um, I think for us, from the outset, um, starting to do research about such a topic, it became evident that it can never kind of be an encompassing project, right? There was like no way um, to hold a conversation that could really kind of tie together kind of the entirety of the question around the empire. And basically, through the process we came in touch and were in conversation with many people where he became kind of very informative for the whole process of thinking and producing and, and kind of moving through the different stages of research. And in that way, I think, more than kind of a curatorial project, I think it was a way for us to set up a platform that kind of allows this conversation to continue within the shop. Um, so in that sense, I don't, I mean, there were kind of many ways in how things sat beside each other, but it not so much, I think, was a kind of thinking about as a curatorial project when all of the kind of edges and seams have to be put together in a very kind of smooth way, but actually, yeah, really giving people, um, people that have informed the project beforehand the opportunity to create an intervention which might have been a contribution, but at the same time might have been a disruption to the proposition, right? Or kind of to the question we put forward. But I think in that sense it's interesting because we, from the beginning, we never thought of it as a curatorial project. It was more we want to look into this issue, and then ah, who knows about this? Who knows about that? We could kind of make a project about that. So I think it evolved more uh, naturally, and that's also why we we struggled a lot on how on the formats of, of presentations or, or projects or contributions, and we because we were quite against say like this is performance, this is a sculpture, this is a talk, this is a, an academic paper, and instead what was important for us is that actually duration didn't really matter because. How would you classify an academic paper that lasts for 10 hours? Or how would you, what would it be a performance that lasts for two seconds? And all those questions that we hadn't thought about before actually became part of the way in which we structured uh, the, platform. the platform through the idea of an agenda. So rather than through discipline or background, it was more, this is an agenda, these are contributions, and yeah, and, basically, yeah well, and basically the question I think also in terms of 
the curatorial is what is the, what is the agency of each one of the kind of interventions rather than kind of the the essence of the project. I think the agency of it is something super important that we should talk about. Um, like Jesse, thank you for that amazing presentation. I think it exhibited your incredible, I think, generosity of spirit, but also sort of generosity of perceptiveness. That, like you all see things that that really matter, like for the world and for your work. And I think that's really great. Uh, to sort of follow though on the sort of research about this question, it's interesting to me that this platform that had such a sort of diversity of protagonists, as it gets refracted through y'all as speakers, it achieves a certain coherence, and I'm, I'm struck by your use of anecdote. Uh, and it seems like it's really central to the proposition that um, rather than sort of undertaking a, a survey that would resemble the sort of the, the scientific or anthropological or uh, any of these kind of uh, a sort of world-making schemas that we have known in academia, that you insist on the anecdote as, as the sort of central scene of action to the point that they become these sort of amazing, almost like just so stories or sort of fables of uh, neoliberalism and, and technology. So I, I'm curious about if you've reflected on the kind of incredible like specificity and idiosyncrasy of the stories that you select and how those for you might crack open the sort of like the, the larger uh, questions because like there's no shortage of large questions like it's environment, the planet, neoliberalism, like it's, it's a huge topic but with such amazingly uh, precise entry points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's really the anecdote for us is quite crucial uh, because usually we come across this kind of absurd, nonsensical, sometimes pieces of news, like different places and then you start thinking about how can this happen, it's like so historical, like how could this happen and then you start you take that as a kind of a, as a serious kind of um, exploration. That, okay, let's go back, for instance, with the murders and the, and the kind of the killings because of this plant that actually was never even in the property. Right? How can this happen? And they just start pulling the thread back to uh, understand the whole system that has led to uh, to that anecdote or anecdotal events to, to happen. And I think at the same time, in the, yeah, I do. I mean, and I think it really kind of follows a lot of the projects. I think there's also in this kind of anecdotes, I think for us there's like a lot of what comes out, out of it, that there's a lot of very big politics that are done, right? And kind of there's a lot of forms of common abuse or government kind of forms of governance that are taking place. And in that sense, I think in many ways, yeah, it's like how to avoid, yeah, or how to find other ways to enter into kind of a more canonical kind of ways of seeing the world because at the end of the day, yes, you can say, okay, like this story of Japanese not me is like, it's an anecdote, right? So two people have killed, and not that I'm kind of not taking seriously the fact that like, the three people died because of it, right? But at the same time, I think what it kind of exposes is something much larger and it kind of opens up a glimpse to how kind of neoliberalism in the face of like the housing crisis in Europe is operating today. And that is, I think, where it becomes like a very valid and serious question. Um, and, I mean, apropos of the novel, I found myself thinking, and maybe we could talk more about the sort of agency or, or, yeah. or whether, uh, how, how much you would sort of claim an activist uh, uh, side to the project because it, it, I, the way you sort of articulate the agency of the not uh, to sort of offset these systems of financialization, uh, how far would you take that in your own right? Because you, you suggest almost that you can begin to like weaponize the not and like how, how far do we sort of go in imagining the outcome of this project? And I think to me that links to maybe the question of y'all as a media practice, like what are your sort of vectors of disseminating this? Uh, how do you see yourselves addressing mm -hmm. uh, a sort of uh, a public that, that learns from these things? Because I, I do think, I really believe that the contour question is like nothing less than changing cultural behaviors. I think that it seems to me that that's the ambition. So I'd love to hear some more. Yeah. Um, well, we can start with the first part. I think some of the kind of interactions uh, that we had with people while we were sitting there for eight hours in front of the shop windows, seeing like hundreds of people passing by, looking at us, looking at our assets. Um, so some people, like the ones who, with whom we had consultation, 
they were saying, ah, oh, wow, but then, uh, if I hate my landlord, can I put Japanese not way like the property? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, or, or, yeah, or if I want to buy a house, maybe I find one that actually I, I detect that has Japanese not in the garden, so then I can use it as a kind of a, a tactic to bargain the price that we know a few cases of the people that did that. They actually bargain um, with the owner and say, like, listen, I know that has not, that Japanese not win, even if you're not telling me. So I'm willing to pay you more in cash because I know that I'm not going to get it. Right? So it can play a role in those kind of bargaining and uh, yeah, loophole tactics. Yeah, yeah in, in that sense, I think yes, there's kind of, if we come back to the question of the agency, then I think there's the projects kind of move from the kind of more a conceptualization of a field and of a question, and then, yes, like how do you disseminate it, and how it becomes a form of media as well. And in that sense, I think today we were speaking about more in the, like, in the question, like, regards to Climavore, we were speaking more of the kind of speculative scenario when you come for a dinner and you're kind of faced with all of these different climatic scenarios or climatic seasons and kind of foods that respond to it. And, it kind of takes a lot into the future, right? But at the same time, what is happening now with the project, and this is kind of how we are developing the work at the moment, is that we're actually starting to work in very localized scenarios. So actually from here, we're going straight to the Isle of Skye in Scotland, where we are working now on a project. The Isle of Skye is one of the biggest producers of farmed salmon. Uh, in Scotland, which is like a billion uh, like pound industry, and basically an industry that has has been for the past thirty years completely destroying the ocean all around Scotland. And uh, this year was the last year, sorry, two thousand sixteen was the first year that there has been a moratorium on the f the fishing of wild salmon because the numbers have basically depleting depleted to almost zero. So then kind of thinking through this idea of climate war and the idea of polluted ocean, we're basically working now on a long-term project for a few years to really think like, how would you start really thinking of and taking this project seriously? And how would you not kind of look at various scenarios but focus on one? And what kind of infrastructures and architectures and spaces have to be made? And what kind of cultural behavior has to be kind of adopted for a certain period of time to kind of rearrange the whole space. So I think that's also what you were saying. <coughs> yeah, we, and we also push it a lot, this idea of climate alterations as a cultural construct. And in the case, for example, the lionfish uh, in the Cayman Islands, we, we see another anecdote that we really like. Um, so we were talking to someone in the Department of the Environment there and they were saying how lionfish uh, became extremely invasive. They had like lionfish all over the island, it had come from Florida to the Bahamas and now it's all over the Caribbean. And basically it's eating every single fish uh, to the point that when in islands that there used to be thousands of different species, now there is one. Um, and it's impossible to kill it or to poison it and the only way to do it is through um, yeah, fishing it with a harpoon or a spike. And, and then so it was this kind of cultural shift where they came up with a brilliant idea to almost kind of declare, not officially, but to a certain extent, declare it a, a, national, a national dish uh, for people <laughs> to start fishing, but also for people to, to, to win prizes in different tournaments. So uh, yeah, the person who fished the most amount of um, lionfish in a day. And then slowly, slowly, the restaurants have started serving lionfish. Uh, and so on and so on. And today it came to a point that really when you go to the Cayman Island you can get lionfish in almost every restaurant. And I think, again, this is like a very anecdotal story, but what is, I think, incredibly important that what has happened through the 20th century mostly is that food has become kind of something or an object that we have to preserve, right? And it's kind of a heritage that has to be kind of carried into the future. Now, for me, this is a really big kind of question because if we are kind of acknowledging that we're living through a time of transformation, how can we think of kind of carrying something with us from history kind of down through generation and generation without kind of completely thinking about, like, transforming it as well? So in that sense, the idea of climate war would really try to think of a heritage with an expiration date, right? And how 
like something you like blind like fish. Yeah. yeah, but after 10 years, when sharks have learned that they can actually eat it and not just like swim beside it, which is, it, which is like slowly starting to happen, then you would never eat another lionfish in your life. Uh, On the subject of media, I would like to ask that one of the things that's I think really interesting is that you opened a store rather than an exhibition or like and you, it was a store on Baker Street and you also had the real estate agency and in a lot of ways by not operating in these like more traditional spaces you have like increased the accessibility of your mm. work mm. Um, even like just yeah. like and the, the anecdote does the same thing yeah. um, in a lot of ways and I was wondering if you could speak a bit to like yeah, yeah. those choices yeah when the, the site was a big kind of task where to find it also because obviously we could not afford renting it on Baker Street. <laughs> um, so it was but we wanted it the central um, central or central part of London because of all these connections to the city and, and, and global finance. And also because we thought it would it would not make sense to have the kind of industrial um, space, you know, gentrified neighborhoods in the uh, or in the cultural center. Or in the yeah, yeah. cultural center. So first it was very important to kind of land in a very strange place, which Baker Street is, with a lot of people, but also in a place that yeah. people would not know how to take it. But, but in that sense, it really what it allowed is to kind of many, like multiple people to enter from very different entry points, right? And what happened with the devaluing real estate agencies that I mean, when that was like when anthropolo like anthropology was being done, right? Because like once you start well, sit well, sitting well, from the inside and looking how people are perceiving like perceiving real estate, I mean the things he, like that happen. I mean it's like you know life is sometimes better than the books, right? And we really have. I mean, no. First of all, like the like the gender division was incredible. I mean, you would have like all of these like couples walking down the street and always the man would like go to the window when the woman would just continue walking down the street and like would be standing in front of the man and like the woman would be like you know a block now right and then of course some people kind of like understood the joke and kind of smiled and they continued other people would come in but it really allowed kind of various conversations that I think if in the frame of an exhibition like wouldn't have happened and I think the same way with this idea of like selling things, right? So it was the same, it wasn't, there was no object within the shop that you can come and sell as an art, like buy as an artwork. Like nothing was in the like, oh, I really love this like fountain, you know, can I put it in my living room? Like how much does it cost? No, you can only get like grammar by ethanol. So it was all the time really trying to kind of push the limits, I think, of how consumption is done and kind of how it's perceived and how we engage with it. And yeah, in that sense, we also pretty in the case of the real estate agency, we had actually across the street a, like a proper one that we were mirroring. Um, so that was kind of the intention, like having like two opposing things with a similar display. Uh, so that was also another kind of friction there. Uh, or even, for instance, we um, uh, self critiques where they came. That was so like the biggest selfridges is down the road, that does where our tables. Selfridges is kind of this huge kind of upscale or yeah. play barn is here. And basically one day, like it was like two days after the shop opened, suddenly like these five people from the research team, of course like everyone has like research teams today. So like five people from the research team of Selfridges like walk into the shop and they're like, what are you doing here? What are you selling? What are you selling? And they're like, oh the stools, I love them. Do you have a measuring tape? Can I measure how big they are? And and the research, the research team started measuring of this tool and taking notes. We and never heard from them again. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I think, but it was, I think, very interesting in how exactly, kind of, what kind of attention and conversation it brought. We have some excellent audience here, so we're ready to open it up whenever y'all have questions. This includes the family. There should be at least one family question. <laughs> Please. I've got a family question. <laughs> so what's in the cake we're eating? Uh -huh. Good question. Good question. So the cake is a, what we spoke about towards the end is the moringa. It's a, a cake made out of moringa and basically 
Moringa is one of the plants that is being uh, used now to create a buffer zone at the edge of the Sahara Desert as a way basically to prevent um, the, <laughs> the, transfer like, yeah, the extensive kind of transformation of the Sahara downwards into southern parts of Africa. Actually, is not weed. Uh huh. Lovely, is, is a plant which is a very long story, but originated in Japan and survives or thrives in the volcanic ashes of, of, of mountains there. And it's from the family of, of the rhubarb. It tastes similar to rhubarb. And the thing is that it thrives in, in Japan in volcanic ashes because it's very kind of sturdy and resistant and that's why in the UK whenever there was this kind of post-industrial landscape after the collapse of many industries in the 70s uh, if you would not take care of any waste wastelands basically it was the first plant that it would start spreading all over and basically it survives in these kind of cadmium soils or kind of, these kind of heavy metal soils and in that sense what was what happened in the 70s with like the whole urban transformation of the UK um, and the whole social housing movement that was taking place like in the 50s, 60s. It basically with all of the construction and like making landfills, moving land from one place to another, they just like spread it all over the country. So it was kind of really through the urban transformation of the the country that like the plant kind of disseminated all of it. How is the ice cream? How? How was it? Very good. Very good. <laughs> no, it was. It was because I think for us, it has to be good. Like I think, yeah, especially in projects like that, it's very important for us that it's something when you're kind of really trying to challenge kind of the perception of someone and kind of giving them some something that they perceive as a threat. It has to be palatable, right? It has to kind of be something that would be consumable. It wasn't trying to make it disgusting, not the top. The idea was to make like, the best ice cream we could. But I will say that I saw the, the inside of the sea metal or the thistle that you made the cocktails from. Yeah. yeah. That I, I saw as a thread. I think Jacob had a couple. Oh, um, I was curious about the book and the, the possibility you mentioned or the part of it that is geared toward um, uh, possibility of making more of these elsewhere, kind of like a, I forget what the term you use, but uh, the possibility of thinking of these things as an anti-franchise or something like that, opening up. So I'm curious what, what that means. And um, I presume that the, the possibility exists for it to consider other postponing situations, other, you know, other fires, obviously. So I'm curious about specifically what kind of, you know, a guidebook there could be for applying some of the lessons you've learned here, especially if we, you know, can go back to the anecdote situation. But, you know, so I'm curious how you start to yeah, yeah, yeah. open it up to other so, situations. I think there's two parts in that. Yeah, totally. Um, oh, yeah, so can you please speak to the storefront idea too as a part of that? Yeah, so that's a little yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a part, I would say, part of content and another part related to structure. So in terms of structure, what was important for us is to how do you come up with economic models to continue projects for the participants of the shop because some of the projects were starting to uh, kind of come up with amazing uh, kind of inputs and uh, we wanted for them to, to continue expanding. So that sense the idea of the franchise would use kind of the royalty uh, to keep producing work. That would be kind of one of the conditions of the agreement, the franchise agreement that we would sign with the person who opens it. And then in terms of, of content, uh, the other kind of condition that is part of the contract is that uh, at least like half of the of the works that are on display have to respond to that uh, traffic context. So if it, the shop opens in Singapore, it would need to relate to, to the context there, or if it opens in Jamaica, the same. But also in different uh, kind of post-imperial contexts, it relates to the Belgian. Uh, um, colonial implications, or French, or Spanish. Um, so you don't define what what of the post-imperial needs to be related to, and what relating to it means. In, no, no, that's not imposed. I mean, I think in, in, so. It's I think more in terms of like the form and kind of the approach, rather than exactly kind of binding it to a certain kind of era, right? But I think 
that basically kind of the way we're thinking of the book and what kind of literally is holding the book together is the contract for the franchise, right? So, and the idea of kind of how this, the contract really can become, I mean, again, it's not going to be the table of contents, right? But how it's in a way allows you to walk, kind of read through the book and kind of read through the contract in parallels, right? And then in the contract, yeah, there are things like a window display is a crucial part of the kind of, of the program of this project, right? And wherever it will open, it has to have a window display. It has to be set on a kind of, of a, a central street in wherever it is, maybe even if it's a small town or big city, right? It doesn't matter. Um, and then yes, there has to be like a way to respond to like a local context and like work with local practitioners, etc. And yet have access to all of the knowledge and material and like website and structures that were already put in place. Hi. Uh, thank you for the amazing presentation. Um, I was wondering more on the same topic of writing the contract for the franchise. Um, I was just curious, I mean, just trying to imagine having to kind of codify such a like nuanced agenda, in a way, into language. Um, I'm curious to know, like, you know, the use of anecdote, the specificity of things, the, the kind of, you know, certain humor of things. Are there certain parts that you know, you really like grappled with how do we write down the requirements for this? Mm -hmm. And then um, also wondering like, you know, through that process of having to put these individual projects into kind of a framework, you know, codified framework, did that, did that level of abstraction kind of change how you thought about the project and, and affect your, you know, like help your understanding of it? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, so there are kind of a few, like the contract, it's a work kind of that is still, like we're still developing, and I think in that sense, yes, there are many kind of things that cannot enter, like exactly kind of, yeah, you have to use like X amount of anecdotes, or although I think it's a very interesting idea, like how do you approach that, and I think, um, yeah, it's something that is interesting to harness, but that might be kind of reflected from the content kind of outwards, rather kind of from the structure like inwards. Um, at the same time, I think with the question kind of with how this, the contract is structured or kind of what is the extent of control we have over the project is something that for us, we are really interested to kind of experiment with as well, right? Because it's not that we see it as a project that wherever it goes now, we have to be kind of the center kind of figures, right? And everything has to be kind of orchestrated around our research and work, not at all. Like, we would be super excited if like an institution would come and say like, hey, like this is super interesting, we would love to do it. We have like a set of curators here or whatever it may be. And like, they're going to lead the process and kind of will be there to guide or to give ideas or to maybe they'll commission a work, like a new project from us, right? But not necessarily we have to be kind of the ones that are like leading it throughout. Because I think, yeah, if you really want to question how this would operate kind of in other contexts, there is like, I think for me it's quite an interesting idea to see how it takes on so a life of its own. Yeah, but in that sense, is the opposite of a franchise. It has to be the same everywhere. And what we like is that it has to be always different everywhere. Can I ask also, sort of following on that question, I'm wondering if you have a sort of, uh, almost a, a kind of spirit philosopher who's sort of guiding your politics. <laughs> but I think they, because I, I'm really struck by the, both the question of which empire and, and the question of sort of how you intervene today, because it, it is really striking the way you take the sort of uh, material culture of colonialism. And you sort of import it in, into the present in certain ways, and you both uh, distance yourself from some of it and then trip on others, like actually sort of performing the empire. Yeah. Or the, the, yeah, the, the, the pudding. Um, and so I'm really struck by that. And I mean, I know that uh, I think we're all fans of people like Michel Ferry who argue that, that if we're going to intervene in, uh, within neoliberalism, that uh, we have to sort of use its, its tools against itself. So I, I, it seems clear to me that you're uh, a, a sort of counter-practice um, 
in that sense, and yet you sort of freely adopt the, like, I, I, I suspect that maybe it wouldn't be an anti-franchise, like you're claiming franchise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not yeah, an yeah, anti-franchise, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're, you're using uh, those devices in terms of, so, so I'd be interested if, if how exactly you sort of position your idea about design, activism, and sort of politics um, mm -hmm. in France. Well, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, very fans of Michel. Um, and I think, yeah, but the, the framework that he's been putting together about how to operate within this neoliberal condition, I think, is, is quite um, enlightening for us uh, in the sense that, uh, or especially within this uh, shift from the relationships between employer and employee to investor and investee, and how we all become uh, investees, and hence forms of resistance that were attached to a form of economic productivity that links more to factories in the 19th century whereby uh, workers would uh, stop in front of the factory, stop the factory and demonstrate, uh, etc. do not work any longer. Right? So how do we embrace the current structures and try to operate within them but at the same time outside? Yeah. And I think then, I think also another big question is kind of question of like the limits of governmentality. Um, and I think in that sense, like, I think James Scott is a, like another person that is, I think, very kind of his work is quite important for kind of our thinking. And yeah, we need to what he writes on the far back instance, right? And um, but yet, how today? Yeah, what are the limits of of government and what are the limits of control and how to kind of use those limits and live within? governmentality and yet kind of have freedom to operate kind of beyond that. Hi, and uh, thank you again also for the lecture, it was fantastic. I have a question about methodology. Uh, on top of the question of the uh, anecdote that I think is central to when you start uh, your research, uh, I'm very interested also in the role that uh, trips uh, play in your work and like uh, you are <laughs> great travelers and I would want to know more about how you face those, how you plan them as essential to your research yeah. methods. Um, yeah, I think what it it's is, very important. I, I think in this project, no, but it was a very instrumental thing and I think, yeah, it's again, I think it might shed some light also on the idea of the anecdote because I think basically, yes, like how do you kind of gain access to certain questions and especially here that we were dealing with a very extensive geography and territory um, yeah the fact of going to places and trying again in a few weeks i mean it's not that we spent like a year in barbados right but yeah even in a couple of weeks to really try and understand kind of what are the challenges that various kind of economies governing like, government bodies or like artists and architects are, are facing and I think we use a lot as a research phase we make an inter like a method of interviews and we speak to a lot of other people and kind of in between supplemented with archival research and with the like with reading etc and then kind of out of a full trip in, of Barbados, you know, in Barbados for two weeks where you kind of encounter a ton of different material, like one project come out. And it's kind of, and I think this is where it, it's kind of, the anecdote kind of almost epitomizes like a condition that like runs across many, many different structures and stratas of society. But for us it's kind of, it's an emblem of kind of a, present condition that is at stake, right? And how then you can start thinking of that, like to intervene into various places. So that's, I think, what is interesting about these trips is that it almost reverses the, kind of the logic of methodology or what we are used to, um, also of ourselves. Um, because to a certain extent, the, kind of the, the logic would be that you choose something extremely specific and then you go there like a hundred times, right? The, kind of the tradition of anthropology, you, to, you really know a group of people who are living in Papua New Guinea, right? You spend 30 years with them. And I think for us, it's almost like the opposite, that we go to a place with kind of extremely generalistic uh, curiosities and uh, try to learn from very different people we interview, like from yeah. agronomers to politicians to farmers to very different groups of people. And then at the end, maybe there is one anecdote that is extremely relevant and that allows us to start connecting all these dots. 
kind of fact. So it's like almost like zooming out uh, from that extremely generalistic uh, entry point. And yeah, and I think, I mean, for me, it's also it's a very big question today when you're kind of thinking of things in the face of like climate change and like how do we operate in under these conditions? Like how? Yes, like what kind of limits of discipline also we are faced because of that, right? And how kind of and I think because of this, yeah, this yeah, and, like, and that, no, and also because of like the expertise we one has to have in order to operate today in the world. I mean, like I think, yeah, on, and well, I can I mean, we teach like we teach in an architecture department, right, at the Royal College of Art, and and you see that it, like when you think about like the students' projects, I mean, it's not enough to teach them how to design. You know, I think you if you graduate today from school only knowing how to design whether it's a building or a home or an urban kind of fabric, it, it's not enough because there are like so many pressures and kind of stakeholders and, and phenomena that are taking place constantly that for us it's really interesting all the time to think how like, you can yeah, address all of this. And, and in that sense, yes, I think we're like very poor historians, you know, <laughs> or like <laughs> in the absolute best way. <laughs> no, but I think there is a crucial question that we ask ourselves all the time, and we kind of, uh, challenge it also to ourselves. Like, how, how is this? Um, how does this make sense? How, how do we make it reverse when it's um, apparently all over the place? Um, yeah. So it's this kind of constant exploration. Yeah. <laughs> I think to me, like, what I find so sort of profound in your approach is I love the way that, I, I love the way that uh, uh, you find these sort of devices so that you connect things across scales. I think in this talk, the calorie was one, the idea that the sort of the calories of uh, the sugar cane and the calories of the labor and these mm -hmm. things. And certainly the other was the idea that eating is infrastructure. And I think that that, uh, for me, is maybe the sort of prime lesson of this talk. And within that infrastructure, the thing I love about your mobilization of the anecdote is precisely that anecdote is the opposite of data. And therefore, it's the thing that helps us find slippages and uh, kind of potential cracks within that infrastructure, of eating the, um, you know, the sort of mechanization of life that, that we uh, dwell within all the time. So with that, unless there's any last moment, Interventions, please join me in thanking our dear friends.